I'm Amanda Harlow. All of us here think we know Carl. I use the present tense deliberately, as he will be with all of us who knew him, and even those who didn't, for the foreseeable future and beyond. Carl Lagerfeld. Quixotic, precocious, prolific, one of the most forceful characters, and yes, greatest designers of the 20th, 21st century indelible as permanent marker. Carl lived for his work, Carl lived for his work. No class in the end was Im as important to him as being working class. So profound was his mercurial thinking that he was able to establish a spirit under a different sensibility for each of the houses he designed for. He would often sit back and wonder at this ability to separate the houses as if he had an enfilade in his design mind, each room differently shaped and filled with different ideas and even a different light. We would collapse onto the jet after the Fendi show to fly back from Milan to Paris to ratchet up Chanel, which would show a week later. And when Paris spread herself in a glitter of houseman geometry beneath us as we began to land, he would often remark how different Paris was from the Italian cities more delicate, less sensual, visceral, and pigmented. How Chanel could never be Italian, nor Fendi, French. It was the same to him as trying to translate Rilke into French or Caterina Pozzi into English. Impossible. He felt the rhythm of place, its voice, its tone, so acutely. His work at best was visual music, sometimes as punctuated as rap, sometimes as mysterious as Schubert. The clue to Carl was his depth. He could read an emotional skeleton in everyone in the same way that I believe he saw ghosts. He was profoundly sensitive and yet an astute strategist and an academic. He was his own library of philosophy, photography, interior design, biography, poetry, art, architecture, history and politics which colored his night visions and fueled his days in the landscape of drifting papers and books. He was happiest lost in this landscape of his mind, and yet he kept this private. He polished his public appearances, so he disappeared behind the black and white. You see, I am recognized everywhere I go. I am like a cartoon of myself, a cipher. I must say, I am quite pleased with this dolly. Powdered hair, dark glasses, stiff collar, tie, tailoring, and a glimmer of a bell peron pin, sometimes his beloved chupette brooch, but always his lucky watch and his mother's lapis signet ring. He had a whole room of Carl portraits, robots, teddy bears, dollies, which he never looked at, preferring instead his Murakami portrait set in a field of flowers. But he loved performing to an audience, however many friends and journalists, TV and film crews, editors-in-chief and celebrities would fill the studio during the final fittings before a show of, say, 98 Passage. He would rise to each and every single one and twist them into his own highly charged foxtrot or rumba. He was energized by the energy of attention. His wit was formidable, like his rapid-fire multilingual punning, which he could also draw as rebus puzzles. He was, in fact, his own unique kind of rebus the public Carl with the hidden meaning behind the form. He literally tangoed with light and shade, public and private. He loved the mix in the paradox, like his eclectic playlists creating new and surprising resonances through juxtaposition and echo. He spliced Corbusier with, Ver with Baroque, Versailles with punk, ancient Egypt with New York, and yet he kept his private world exotically and hermetically private. When I asked him once if he thought he would ever fall deeply in love again in the way that he had loved Jacques de Bachet, what if Carl some spectre de la Roche should leap through your open windows? He replied, I always sleep with my windows tight.
height he shut. It was only when he took off his dark glasses to sketch that I noticed the softness of his light brown eyes, the way they raked the whole room while he was talking to one person as if he was sizing up everyone's reaction to what was being fitted or what he had said. Carl was meteoric, a force field of lightning ideas and visions. He was his own St. Elmo's fire, illuminating everyone around him. He was an artist and had the impatience of a visionary and the practical nous of an engineer. Indeed, his clothes were engineered to the limits of their lightness. Carl was never more engaged than when he was working on the making of a collection. His sketches obsessed him. It took hours sometimes for him to find exactly the angle of attitude he was chasing. He would joke about how full his waste paper book basket got. Fittings could be a battle initially until we all understood exactly what was in the sketch. Every millimeter mattered. Just as the focus of everyone in the studio, every premiere and second had to follow Carl's line entirely, however new and potentially impossible the gravitational challenge. Carl exacted acts of faith and the reward was his absolute loyalty and kindness. And yet he would question and refine his fashion proposition right up to the show. As the applause rose above the finale music in the Grand Palais, and he was about to walk out into the light, he would look at me and say, that doesn't make the next one. And in the corners of his magnificent mind, even then en coulisses, with the thunder of applause like tremendous waves landing on the shore, he began all over again. 